Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa usalli wa usallim ala al-mab'uth rahmatan lil-alameen Nabiyyana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een In tonight's lecture inshallah entitled What do you really know about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, This lecture was a suggestion from the brothers to be here in the hall for something for our, for our non-Muslim brothers and also for our non-Muslim friends and colleagues at work. And this topic, I want to ask at the beginning, just because we're in the hall now, I'm not going to change the way I lecture or teach. I'm going to ask questions as well. Even though you guys are farther away than the masjid, inshallah, I'm still going to ask questions because this is how I am, this is how I teach. And at the beginning, I want to apologize to the brothers who are in line with us because the way the laptop is on the podium, they're actually looking at the bottom of my beard because they can't, the camera can't get all of it, so I apologize to the brothers and sisters who are in line with us. They're not going to be able to see my face, but inshallah they can hear what I'm saying. Now I looked at it, they're seeing the bottom of my beard only from here. Alhamdulillah. The topic we have chosen tonight, first of all, how many non-Muslims do we have with us today? Is there any, I think there's a few I met before we came in. Any of you guys just want to see a raise of hands? Don't be shy, don't be scared. Any non-Muslims in the sister side? One. Two, alhamdulillah. So the, the majority are Muslims, even though they, what's the, the goal or the intention was also for the non-Muslims to benefit from the title. Nonetheless, inshallah, perhaps more will come uh, later on. And whether Muslim or non-Muslim, inshallah, will benefit from the subject tonight. The title, what do you really know about Muhammad? May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Who can tell me why we chose this title for the, for the topic? When they asked, we want something that could be beneficial and good, for both Muslims and non-Muslims. Why will we choose this topic? There's, there's, there's hundreds of topics we could have talked about. Why this topic in particular we choose it? Okay, we came to love Muhammad. This benefits us. What about for the non-Muslim? Does this benefit him? Hmm. There you go. Jamil, he's a mercy to mankind. So a, both a non-Muslim and, and Muslim, will both, both of them will benefit from this. Uh, what else? Nam, also. What else? Anything else? What has happened in the media t these days with our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What's going on? He's, he's constantly attacked now in Western media in the last, over the last uh, few years. So they've given a, a bad can, uh, or, a mis or we have misconceptions about our beloved Prophet So a non-Muslim probably only knows what he hears from the media. He never mixes with Muslims or, or him, perhaps he has not read about the Prophet Muhammad so he doesn't know himself. Just like now a lot of times when you sit with non-Muslims you know, and it happens to me all the time with the way I look. You know, they see me, oh, it's one of them. Huh? It's one of the guys they bring on the news. So they see they get scared. But then when they sit down with you and they see, you know, alhamdulillah, Muslims, they're normal people. They're not out for, to get your blood, you know. Alhamdulillah. You, they, they realize once they mix with the Muslims. So these, these topics are important because we have these misconceptions about our beloved Prophet wasallam. So we as Muslims benefit, so we can relay the message to the non-Muslims. And also... The non-Muslims themselves, they can benefit from the topic by hearing the truth itself. When we talk about the attacks on our beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, why is there so much focus these days in the media on our beloved Prophet sallallahu Why do they focus on attacking our beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Who can tell me? You, you raise your hand, man. You're caught. <laughs> so, uh, If you discredit the witness, you discredit the message. Mumtaz. So now obviously you start there. You need, they try to, you need, Islam, where did Islam come from? It came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Through who? Through Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. So obviously if you start there, as the brother mentioned, uh, this is the goal obviously of this. And they try to say the freedom of speech and what have you. And we say it's unfortunate that many people have a lot of misunderstandings about a lot of things in life. And from them, we see that they focus on the misunderstanding of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We are talking, and I'm going to give two examples of something else to show, and just to put emphasis on how people misunderstand things. 
We were talking the other day about life in Sudan. Now, when I first graduated from the university in uh, Saudi Arabia, my, I, I had a job offer in Saudi Arabia, a job offer in America, and a job offer in Sudan. So my father said I would prefer America, but if you don't choose America, then choose Saudi Arabia. Uh, he said that there are allies, and um, it's safe there, it's modernized there. And he said, but Sudan, please don't go. It's a very dangerous place, it's this, and he has a big long list. Why? Because where is he getting his information? Fox News, CNN. Uh, these are the people who are filling his head with, a, with a, a certain thing about Sudanese people and about Sudan. So, I didn't want to disobey my father, but I found that the best thing for my family and myself at that time was for us to go to Sudan. And that's where we ended up going. So when I went recently to Canada, and I met with my father there, the Sudanese people, they threw a big celebration for him and for my stepmother. So when he went to the masjid, to the mosque there, and he sat with the Sudanese people, now these are the people who have genocide now. They're claiming on the news that 200, it was 200,000, oh, and, then, and then a week later it's 400,000 people have been killed. And we know this, the people who live there, it's all lies. There has been mistakes that have been made in the Darfur region. There have been innocent people who have been killed. This, this is true. But the numbers that are given on the news, it's not even close to the reality. The true numbers are about 10,000. But when they put on the media, it becomes 400,000. How does it make it look? Much worse. So my father, I'm sure he's a little nervous. He's going with these people who have, have killed 400,000 people. Uh -huh. And he's, now he's going to go into a mosque. What's a mosque? He doesn't know this mosque. What do we do in this mosque? It's kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's something weird. What, what are they doing there? What are they worshiping in there? So it's the first time. So he's going into this mosque with these barbaric people who have killed 400,000 people, uh, these bloodthirsty Sudanese, and he's going into the, into the uh, mosque with them. So when he sat with them, anybody who knows the Sudanese, they're mo the most lovely people in the world. Everybody knows this. They're very kind, very innocent people, very fun people, laugh, get along with, joke with. So he sat down with them, and if it wasn't for my stepmother, she had finished and from, on, the, on the woman's side, I don't think he would have left because he enjoyed himself there. So the misconception was taken away through what? Through mixing. Uh, with these people. I'm going to give it another example and I'm going to go out on the limb with this. This is an expression we use. I don't know if you use it in the UK. We use it in America. And it, what does this expression mean when I say go out on the limb? And some people might not like the example, but I'm going to use it. Another place a lot of people have misunderstanding about is where I come from, from America. True, the, the, the politics of our government, we don't agree with it, and it's caused a lot of problems throughout the world. However, inside America, it's a different story. Alhamdulillah, still even though, obviously as Muslims we have our issues with them, uh, when they spy on us and follow us and what have you, nonetheless we still have our freedom, as long as we're not up to anything that they consider to be wrong, Alhamdulillah, we're allowed to practice our religion freely. We're allowed to teach about Islam. We don't have the problems like they have in some European countries now, France or what have you, when it comes to the, the niqab. In America, Alhamdulillah, the sisters still wear their face veil without being pressured by anybody. And they still they say in America, now you can do what you want. And if you want to wear a niqab, if she wants to put a bone in her nose and have a mohawk, whatever she wants to do. So alhamdulillah, we still have the freedom and we benefit from this. So now America itself, it's misunderstood. Why? Because of the policy of the government and the politics they have outside of America. People will assume that this is the situation inside of America. And it's not the case. So we come back to the topic at hand, which is talking about our beloved Prophet wasallam, and the, how people misunderstand him. Why? Because where do they get their information from? from this media who uses uh, these attacks to what? Give a bad message about our Prophet Sallallahu When I was choosing a topic for my master's thesis, I looked into something that I wanted to benefit me. And I could have done a lot of things. But one of the, uh, the, the few topics or the two topics that I chose from, one of them was the problems they face in the West and the cure from Islam. And we say the cure from Islam, where does it, Islam come from, this cure? Where do we take it? We, the sources are two. If we're going to find a cure in Islam, we have to find it in one of two sources. The Quran and the Hadith, the state, sayings and the actions of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. So I started to gather up. So when I go to my supervisor and tell him this is what I'm looking into, 
I said I found about 30 different things from the problems they face in society. Obviously, not everything, but I'm talking in the society, the Western society, the problems they face, and we have the cure in the Quran and in the Sunnah, and the, in the hadith or the sayings or actions of our Prophet wasallam. From these things, if you look at the family life in the West, how is the family life now in the West? When it comes to respecting one's mother or father and the family ties in general. Is it in a good status in the West? Yes or no? I, I see people are dead today. Hmm? Huh? It's, a bad, it's, a, it's in a bad state. Leave. In Islam, how does Islam look at this? What does the Quran and Sunnah tell us about our parents and how we should treat our parents? Is it, does it have a... How's the emphasis? Is it strong in the middle? Very strong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, after he mentioned the basis of Islam, what is, the, what is Islam? The core of Islam, which is the issue of Islamic monotheism, worshiping Allah as one and not joining any partners with him, he mentioned what? Being kind to the parents, right after this. So it shows us the importance of the parents and the status of the parents in Islam. Another thing I found was the issue of the fornication which happens in the societies now. Now out of 39% 39, 39 in America, I'm talking more about America, obviously where I'm from, I have the statistics, even though I did get some from the UK today, I added on to this. Uh, fornication in the West, where now people out of marriage, 39% of the, of the, this is two years ago, I'm assuming it's probably more now, 39% of the children born in America were born out of wedlock. And some people might say this is not a big deal. But obviously to the Americans it is, because the researchers and the, edu and the educators in, in the West, in America, they said that in the 1980s, we found that in America we faced a problem with children being born out of wedlock and young women giving birth. So we encouraged the girls to use birth control, starting from the, a young age in the high school, and then later on it goes down to the middle school where they encourage them to use birth control. But it didn't work. And they continue to have children out of wedlock. In the 90s, there was a new problem on the rise. What was the new problem? The STDs, the sexually transmitted diseases. They started to spread like wildfire. Now, they have to look for a new cure, which is for them to, what? For the man now to use a contraceptive in order not to catch anything. And then... They said now in the 2000s, since they didn't listen to us in the 90s as well, and the STDs continue to spread, that the only cure is for us to go back to tell them just to wait until they get married. It's the only cure. So I laughed when I read the article. I said, now after all these years of trying to make the, that which is haram, which is uh, not permissible in any religion, whether it's Islam or Christianity or, or, or even in Judaism, that now it's not permissible in any religion. And now you're coming back to religion after all these years. So we need this cure, which comes in Shalal Islam, and the focus on this. Islam, when it focuses on the uh, sexual relations that are haram, that are not permissible between men and women, is the focus on it also, is it something weak or in the middle or something very severe? Something very severe. It focuses on it big time in the Quran and the Sunnah. And you see now the dangers, and it shows the beauty of Islam, when you see how these diseases spread, and the problems that are happening throughout the world, that... It's not, and it, you, you'll see that the cure in Islam, why I focus on it so much. I was sitting in Sudan, we had some students who came from France. I mentioned maybe one of the lectures here. Some medical students. And they were telling me it's no big deal. All we have to do is be careful and, and do what you want to do. This is their outlook in life. Do what you want, and it's no big deal. Everything's no big deal to them. So when I looked now at the statistics in America, that one out of four teenage girls in America has a, from the age of 14 to 19, has a sexually transmitted disease. One out of four, that's 25%. One out of four American adults have herpes, 45 million. Small amounts or big amounts? It looks like a problem to me, and they're telling me it's not a big deal. Do what you, for me, it looks like a major problem now. SubhanAllah. We mentioned before, 39% of children born out of wedlock. Now researches show that these children born out of wedlock the criminals in the criminal system now in America, the majority of them are from these children because they're not raised properly, they're left to do what they want. They don't have a mother and father in their life or maybe just a mother and not a father in their life. So this is how they turn out. 
Other issues when you look into an Islam and the cure for Islam, the cure, the cure Islam has for these problems. The issue of the hijab that the Muslim woman wears when she covers herself and people say this is unfair to her in the West now, that she should have her freedom to uncover. Now, the majority of women, I don't want to put the women on the spot who are upstairs because I don't want the men to look back at them, but if we would ask now, any how many of the women, their husband forced them to cover their faces from the women who are covered. Alhamdulillah, I think the majority upstairs are covered now. But if I would ask you, find the majority of them, that they chose to do this by themselves. And you'll see the hikmah, the wisdom behind this, that when a man does not see a woman uncovered, it doesn't affect him and drive his sexual desire to fall into that which is displeasing to Allah. In the West now, the issue of rape. And I used to always, when I was debating these, these people from France, I was giving them examples from America and these statistics. They said, no, France is better than this. So I don't know. I'm going to research on France, inshallah. I have a, to see in the future. But today I brought something from England as well. And he, but in America, I want to read these statistics to show you and in Islam, when something is made haram, and the cure we have it in Islam, it shows us the beauty of our religion. Also, when you look in a Muslim society, and you don't find this filth, it's also one of the things that shows you, where does this come from? And why is the rape statistic so high in the West and so low in a Muslim society? It's something to think about. In America now, it says here, I'm going to read it, what they have written from their websites. Somewhere in America, America's a big place, huh? somewhere in America, a woman is raped every two minutes. Somewhere in America, a woman is raped every two minutes. According to who? To this guy standing in front of you with the big beard. According to the U.S. Department of Justice. Not according to me. The FBI estimates that only 37% of all rapes are reported to the police. So it could be more. And the U.S. Justice Department, they say it's even lower with only 26% of rapes uh, being reported. They say the rapists themselves, 30, uh, 73%, excuse me, of rape victims know their assailants. Only 6% of rapists ever spend a day in jail. Justice and equality, the American way. The UK now, the United Kingdom, also now we have this now, they're spreading throughout the Islamic world, and they want the Muslims to be like them and to implement their system on the earth. And they say this is the way to, for uh, the person to be free, to be like the West, the democratic system. I was actually very shocked because the UK is much smaller than America to see the statistics I found today. The ones I have for America are the old. I, I, I did the research on America. It said according to a news report in B, uh, on BBC presented on the 12th of November 2007, there were 85,000 women raped in the UK in the previous year, in 2006. That equals 230 cases every day in the United Kingdom. 230 women raped every day in the United Kingdom. Um, from this, you see the justice was served to the rapist, obviously. How many of them were caught? 800. Out of 85,000, 800 cases were solved. I don't want to go into detail. This is not the topic we have at hand. But I'm pointing out something is that when I did the research about uh, Islam and the cures you'll find that the Prophet ﷺ brought for mankind, as the brother mentioned, that he's a mercy to mankind. You'll see that the penalties in Islam for such an Islamic state is why you do not find these type of crimes. They talk about the, the democratic way in this. The hijab. First of all, when it comes to rape, why does a man eventually reach to rape? Because of what he sees. When he sees a woman walk around half naked, what does this do to him? How does this, any man, any normal man, it's going to affect him in a negative way. And that leads him to fall into this heinous crime. After that, the penalty. And what's the penalty in the West? It's not that severe. So he's willing to take it. The penalty in Islam being so severe, you'll see that what? Alhamdulillah, that God has protected our societies from that. Alhamdulillah. I have here other statistics, what I'm not going to read, about what happens in the houses with the children being molested in the West. And it's something, when I read it, well, it made me sick to my stomach, and I don't wish to read it now. But this is just to show you of what goes on in these societies, and that they are in need of what the Prophet ﷺ brought as a mercy to all of mankind. And I'll mention this last fact before I go on to the next topic. 
This I found very interesting. Uh, I attended a conference about AIDS control in Sudan. Some African students, they invited me to come and they wanted me to talk about uh, AIDS and what have you from an Islamic perspective. So one of the things that was said, and he, the, the person who was talking about that, he was obviously specialized in it, he was working for the UN, and he had the PowerPoint, and he was showing us where AIDS is, is in Africa. And he showed that the level of AIDS in the non-Muslim areas was much higher than in the Muslim areas. And this is very strange. I didn't understand why. And he mentioned that a Sudanese professor in John Hopkins University in the U.S., which is one of the top uh, universities, especially in the medical field in the, in the United States, he was working there. He did a research on this. So he found that one of the reasons, and we're talking about the cure, and this is the research I had before, the cure Islam has for these problems that mankind faces. He mentioned that the Muslims, even though they might fall into that which is displeasing to Allah and that which is forbidden by fornicating, he said, but however they found the difference is that the Muslims are circumcised. SubhanAllah. He said he found that the Muslims are circumcised so the AIDS would be less than, what, than, what, than the non-Muslims. He said also, they found that, and he, when they asked the Muslims who fornicated, most of them, even though they knew they, what they did was not permissible, they would make the full ghusl after they would go home. They would be ashamed, and they would have to pray, so they would make ghusl and they would clean themselves. And they found that non-Muslims didn't care if they cleaned the area or not. So all of this, they said it affected more in the spread of AIDS. So I found this very interesting. And this also shows you the cure Islam has for these problems that are spread throughout the world. When we look at the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we say he's one of the most misunderstood men in the world today. But if we look at even the non-Muslims who have studied the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and looked into his seer, into his biography, look at the conclusions they have come up with. One of the most famous examples is that of Michael Hart when he, went to, and he did his famous book about the 100 most influential men in, in, throughout history. And the first one he chose was who? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our, our, our Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Why did he say he chose him? Does anybody know? I'm sure you do. It's a famous statement. Why did he choose the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And he said, as a Christian, it was difficult for him to choose anybody else than Jesus alayhi wa sallam. Why did he choose the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Because he was the only person throughout history who was successful in every field. And when our brother says in every field, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, he was not somebody who was just good in what? Or he was not somebody who was focused on the spiritual aspect of life. He was also the president of the, of the Muslim state. He was also the leader of the army. We mentioned this yesterday in yesterday's lecture. He was also what? The judge of the courts. Uh, when a, when a, a Muslim man and woman, they had a disagreement, who do they come to? Hmm? Who? So the Prophet Muhammad he, he was the one in charge of everything at that time. So all levels of life, all aspects of life, he's the only person in history who was able to cover all of these aspects and to what? Excel in it. Also, if you look at other people, what they said about him, I have several things here because of the time, I don't want to talk too much because I want to open the floor and show if anybody has any questions. And I want to give some examples. I'll mention what Gandhi said. But I'm only going to mention the last sentence. And I'm going to leave the rest for you to go back and find it yourself. Go to the internet and look and see what Gandhi said about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I'm going to read the last two sentences of what he said. He said, when I closed the second volume of the Prophet's biography, I was sorry there was no more to be read of his great life. And he mentioned a whole bunch of nice things before that. But I want to leave that. I want people to go back and to see for themselves. And so many people. Now I can sit here all night. I have a whole list of what people have said about the Prophet وسلم, of non-Muslims who went and read about his biography. And when the Muslims, the issues that happened in Denmark and what have you, when the non-Muslims saw this, this was, they, were, they were surprised. How can somebody, I mean, 1,400 years ago, and still they still have this love for this man. SubhanAllah. And he, I remember now my friend, he told me, I was, come, I was in Heathrow at the time that the problems happened in Denmark. And he said, it came time for Salat al -Dhur. So he, I said, I went, I made the adhan, and I prayed. He said, when I got up, he said, there was a whole crowd of people around me. 
يعني tens of يعني هو maybe up to 100 people around him. They saw he's a Muslim, obviously. So they want to know where can they read more and find out more about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Because they want to know what, what made these Muslims react the way they did. Why did they love him so much? So when I looked into his biography, I know we only have a short time. I want to see what are the things that stood out that would make a Muslim love him so much and also a non-Muslim who doesn't know anything about him to gain this type of respect as we see of all these non-Muslims who also have praised our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of the greatest things you'll see in his biography is that of his manners, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. And every society, they, they claim that what they, their society is built on is good manners. But the difference is, when you go to the West now, for example, when you go to buy something in the store, do the people have good manners or not? I don't know about the UK. America, I, don't know, I don't know any American brothers with us today. So I have to keep picking on the brothers from the UK. Uh, do, when you go to buy something in a store now in the West, in general, people they have good manners or not? UK they don't? Not in America they do. We have great manners in, a, in the store. Why? It's not because they want to have good manners or they're in a good mood. It's because the fact that they have to. They'll get fired if they don't. And they have to sell stuff. So you'll find they're very happy when you come in. They're smiling and this. So they, you, and a person who goes to this type of society, you'll say, mashallah, you have good manners, very nice people. The, but why? Because they want to sell something. It's for money. It's not for any, another reason. But the Prophet وسلم, as it came into his, in, in the hadith, that one of the reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him to all of mankind was to perfect what? Good manners. And that's why Aisha, his wife, radiallahu anha, may Allah be pleased with her, when she was asked about his manners, she said his manners was what? The Quran. Why the Quran? What is in the Quran that makes his manners so special? What's in the Quran? What type of manners are in the Quran? Who can give you some examples? What do you mean? Uh, to be kind. This is a type of kindness. To be kind to people, not to be what? Believe, not to be harsh. Excellent. What else? It doesn't have to be talking about him specifically in the Quran. In general, we're talking about the manners that are in the Quran. No. To not be somebody who's what? Uh, conceited type. You know? Jameel, what else? Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, ittaqullah wa kunu ma'hu with who? O you who believe, fear Allah and be with who? Allah said in the Quran, O you who believe, ittaqullah, fear Allah and be with the sadiqeen, the truthful. The issue of sidq, of being truthful. The issue of adal, of being just. I'm not having dhulm, not having oppression. The list goes on and on and on in the Quran. You'll find the examples of the good manners in the Quran. So when Aisha, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, was asked, how was his manners? She said his manners was that of the Quran. Of being just, of being truthful, of not being what? Oppressive. All of this. So the Prophet ﷺ, in his manners, he was not somebody who just uh, said it. He was somebody who acted and lived it in his life. And at the same time, he called his companions to implement it. And he said that barely the heaviest thing in the scale of your deeds, because everybody's deeds on the Day of Judgment, whether he's a Muslim or non-Muslim, will be put into a scale and will be weighed to see which one is, is, uh, is more and to see where he will go, inshallah, to the hellfire or to, to, the, or to the paradise, inshallah ta'ala. So now the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when... Uh, he told his companions that the heaviest thing in the scale was that of good manners. All of this shows us in Islam, how Islam focused on having good manners and the good manners of our beloved Prophet ﷺ. The second issue is that of his generosity. The Prophet ﷺ, and the peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, was somebody who was very generous. And it came in one of it, the hadith in his seerah ﷺ that a Bedouin came to him after he became Muslim. He was a new Muslim. And the Prophet gave him from the sheep, as it was described, it was between a mountain and another mountain. And something, I mean, as far as the eye can see, he gave him all of these sheep. So when he went back to his people, he said, all of you go to Muhammad because he gives a giving of somebody who does not fear being poor. So he was very generous. And he was even said anything he would have, if you ask him something his own, he would have given it to you. Alayhi salatu wasalam. And that brings us to the next issue, the third point, which is his zuhud. His zuhud, which is 
the, the fact that he, did not, he left the worldly things of this life. He was not somebody who was into the worldly affairs of this, of this life we live in. It, it's even said that when he died, alayhi salatu wasalam, he left nothing behind. The only thing he left behind was some of his armor, which he had left with a Jewish man who he had taken, taken a loan from, and he left that as collateral with him. He left nothing behind. There was nothing in his house. And we're going to go back to what we said before. This is somebody who was what? The leader of the Muslim state. And the, true, a lot of the Muslims at that time were poor, but there was also a lot of rich companions. And they had money at the Muslim state, especially towards the end. So now they had the ability. He could have been rich if he wanted to. He could have lived a luxurious life if he wanted to. But he, he chose not to. And that's why his wife, Aisha, she said, may Allah be pleased with her, that it would come a month and two months, and they would go into the third month, and the fire would not be lit in, meaning the fire that you would cook on, would not be lit in his house. I mean, there's no, nothing to eat. So her nephew, Urwa ibn Zubair, he asked her, uh, how did you survive? And she said, al-aswadan, which meant the dates and water. That's all they had to eat and live off was dates and water. So this is a man who was the king of everything at that time. He's in charge of everything. And this is how he lives, a very simple life. At the same time, he used to sleep on hasir. I don't know what it is in English. Do you know what hasir is? Hmm. The people who have hasir in their countries, they know what it is. But I don't know, the name of an English, I don't know a name for it in English. Hasir, anyways, I'll describe it to you. It looks like, uh, almost like bamboo sticks. And it's put tight together. And they use it in still some countries as like walls and barriers and what have you. And at that time, they used it sometimes. If they didn't have money, they would even sleep on it. So our beloved prophet... May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. He used to sleep on this. And it would leave indents and marks on his body. It was obviously not something comfortable. So when his companions saw this, they wanted to get him a nice bed. How can somebody so beloved to us and somebody so important to us, he sleeps in this type of situation. So he told them, forget it. Because he didn't want to have his heart attached to what? To this world. He was somebody who was focusing on the hereafter. He's somebody who had a message to call all of mankind to. And he wasn't concerned about what he had from this worldly life. So when somebody sees this, and you look at all the other kings at the time, how they had the gold and the, and the pearls and, the, and all of this, and look at how, how our Prophet, and he could have had it as well, alayhi salatu wasalam. He chose not to, so he could focus on the hereafter. The fourth point is his humbleness, how humble he was. And you'll see this all throughout his biography. In his biography, it said that if anybody would come to him with a problem, whether it be a servant in a house, a servant in the house, a young boy, a young girl, a, a woman who had a problem at home, a man who had a problem, he would come to him. They said even the young, the young girl sometimes would take his hand, the young servant, and take him to the side to talk about her problem. A young boy would come to him and talk about his problem. And he would go to the side and he would listen to their problem and, and tell them what they need to do. SubhanAllah. This is the person who is, who is what? He's the king, he's the, he's the rais, he's the president of the country, he's the head of the courts, he's the general of the army. Now if you can't even get near to somebody like that, and, 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 and talk about your problems, I have a problem with it. Small problems, it could be something very simple. And he would listen to them and he would what? give uh, them his advice. That shows you how humble he was, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Also, in the issue, when he was invited, he would go to any, anybody. If somebody invited him over to the house... He would go and he would, to the invitation, he would go to their house. Even if it was somebody that we would look at as not being important. A famous story happened to him. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. When a Jewish man invited him over. And I want to sh uh, look, at this, look at this story. How this Jewish man disrespected our beloved prophet. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. He invited him over for dinner. And now he's inviting somebody who is, he is the head of Medina. And, and as it, Medina starts to spread out during the time, and the Jews during that time, they were under his rule. <coughs> so this is the president coming over. Even if it's somebody from a different religion now. If any of you now, if you were to now, for example, myself, if somebody would tell me that Barak is going to come over for dinner tonight. He's a non-Muslim, I'm a Muslim. But the fact that he's the president of a country, and when he comes over, I'm going to give him something that's suitable for a president. He's not my belief, he's my guest. I'm going to give him something suitable for him. When he comes over to this Jewish man, what did he give him for, for dinner? 
Anybody know the story? Dry bread. Old bread. Not, not, it wasn't even new. Nothing else was just bread. And just gave it to him. Gave it, it's kind of insult. So what did our prophet do? Hmm? He said, you have no respect. Huh? Slapped him. He said, take him out. Huh? He, alhamdulillah, he, he smiled. He ate it. Because he, he realized. He said, look at this person. He, who he was he was dealing with. He ate it and said nothing to the man. He ate the dry bread and then thanked the man for inviting him over and he left with, subhanAllah. Look how humble somebody is. Now, any, any, somebody, if, you, if we were to go to somebody's house and they don't bring you, mashallah, 10, 12 plates, who's this person? I, I dare them invite me over. And Dominique invites me over now. He brings a sahan of fool, just a plate of fool. He said, you know. Look at this guy, he just, just fool. Who does he think he is inviting me over like this? Huh? But look at our Prophet, peace be upon him, subhanAllah. He gives him, it's an insult, and he meant to insult him. Didn't say anything, and he ate it on top of that. And then he thanked him and left the man's house, subhanAllah. The fifth point is the fact, when you look into his biography, that you see he never sought revenge for himself. Even the people who harmed him and harmed his companions throughout his life, he never wanted to, to get revenge for themselves. I think we mentioned some of this yesterday as well in the lectures, but it's okay to mention it again. If one of us, if somebody were to harm us in any way, and we were able to what? Get revenge. What would we do? The majority of us. If somebody now were to insult you, and call you names, kill his, some of his companions, try to kill him, alayhi salatu wasalam, when he was leaving Mecca, before he left and he migrated to Medina, why were they waiting at his door? To see him off? Have a nice trip? Bon voyage? No? Why were they there? They were there to kill him. They were there to kill him. Even with this, when he had the opportunity to get revenge, what did he do? In the war of Badr, when 70 of the non Muslims fell into, to be prisoners of war, the first time that the Muslim and non Muslim armies met in war, and the Muslims were victorious, even though they were outnumbered. What happened to the 70 prisoners of war? What did the Prophet ﷺ want to do? What choice did he choose? He went to his companions and he asked them. Also, this shows you how humble he was. He didn't say, it's my way or the highway. I make the rules, you follow. He goes to his companions. He goes to his wives and asks them their opinions about things. So he goes to his companions and he asks them, what do you think we should do about this? What did, his, and he, what did the Prophet say? which which one did he choose? There's two things, two ideas that were given to him. Which one did he choose? A ransom, obviously not to execute them, and for a ransom to give them back. Because he said now, why, why is he here? Why was he sent to mankind? As a mercy to mankind. He doesn't want to, his goal is not to kill people. He wants now at this time to, for them to come to Islam. He's calling to Islam. He's, he sees the, 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 what Allah has, has blessed him with, with the message of Islam, and this is what he wants for his people. He doesn't want to come and seek revenge. SubhanAllah, even when he went to, we mentioned yesterday, the, the conquering of Mecca. When he went and he came into Mecca, and the Muslims then took over Mecca in the eighth year of the Hijrah. How did he come in? Very humble, we mentioned. So for those of you who weren't with us yesterday. I, how, how was his head when he went in? His head was down. And to of uh, being humble. Now one of us, if you come in, mashallah, you get the chance now to uh, take over a place who has been killing the Muslims, has been fighting the Muslims for several years. Your people have been killed. Your relatives, some of the most beloved people to you have been killed. And now you have the chance to get revenge. Because he's coming and the army has taken over. He comes in with his head down, alayhi salatu wasalam, from Tawadu, being humble. And he tells them that whoever enters his house and locks his door, he's safe. I mean, because you're not fighting. Or whoever enters the mosque in Mecca, the Masjid al-Haram, then he is what? He is safe. Whoever enters the house of Abu Sufyan, then he is safe. All of these are examples that shows you that he never sought revenge for himself. And this came in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Also, we see in another point the kindness that the Prophet ﷺ had when dealing with people. And we mentioned an example last night about what, what happened in the masjid during his time. The man came, he's a Bedouin, he came, 
and he urinated in the masjid. We mentioned how the Sahaba wanted to deal with it. And the way the Sahaba wanted to deal with it was the, what most people would deal with it. Because the Prophet is not from the, the, the normal people, he's more, he's greater than that. This is what we're pointing out now. How great his character was, alayhi salatu wasalam. How did he deal with it? Now, the, the Sahaba got up and said in the hadith, Hammu bi. They want, they want to hit him. They want to beat him down. And obviously, any, anything now, even if somebody were to come in here now, in the corner, Bismillah, to the side, when he, what, what, what would most people do? All of us. It's an insult to, to, to us now, sitting here. Whether we're talking about religion or talking about dunya, the fact that we're in a place, a professional place, and somebody comes to the corner, huh? it would be an insult to all of us. And you would see most people get up. The Prophet said, Da'hu, leave him. And that's why the man at the end, when he saw the beautiful character of our beloved Prophet, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, he said, Allahumma. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to what? Give mercy to him and to Muhammad and to nobody else. And that's why he said, Laqad harjartu wasi'an. Yeah, yeah, he said you should make dua for everybody after that. Also, another story. The servant of the Prophet ﷺ, who was the famous Sahabi that was his servant from the age of 10. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu. He was somebody, when he came to Medina, the Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon him. Anas' mother brought Anas to him. And he said, this is my, my boy. I want him to be with you as your servant. So obviously as a young boy, and he, he wants to play and have fun just like everybody else. So he said in a story that one time the Prophet sent me to do something for him. And when I came out into the street, he said, I saw the other young boys playing in the street. So I stopped and was watching them. Now this could have been something very important he was sent for. But he said, so after I took a long time, he said, I felt somebody putting their hand on behind me. So he said, I looked, and it was the Prophet. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. How was the face of the Prophet Sallallahu Like our faces, if we were to send one of our sons or one of our workers or somebody who was helping us, full of, of, of rage and anger, bright red. Now we turn bright red anyways, the Irish people, and we get mad. Huh? We turn bright red from the anger. How was, what was the Prophet Sallallahu doing when he looked at him? Anybody know the story? Smiling. Smiling at him. And he said, yeah, Unis. His name is Anas. And you know, if anybody know the Arabic language, you say, Unis, it's a way of, of spoiling somebody. He said, Unis. He said, what did I send you for? He said, you sent me for this? And he said, then go do it. SubhanAllah. Look at, look at the, the character of our Prophet ﷺ. He, he disobeyed him now, not, not doing what he's supposed to do. And it could have been something very important. Also, Anas said, he served the Prophet, may the peace and blessing of, uh, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, for 10 years in Medina. He said, I never heard from him, uff. As it came in the Quran, uff. And uff is, is, is the smallest amount of disrespect you can say. And that's why Allah said in the Quran, don't say to your parents, uff. If your mother says, go do this, you don't say, uff. Or like they do today, hmm. just like uff. I don't want to do it. He said, I never even heard from this. And I didn't hear from anything I did. Why did you do it like this? If you had done it like this, it would have been better. So subhanAllah. You'll see now the character of our beloved Prophet. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Also, you can mention point seven, which is the fact how forgiving he was. And we mentioned him before in the conquering of Mecca, how he forgave the people. And also the people who wronged him throughout his life, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. also he always used to forgive them for what they, would do, what they would do to him, what they would say to him. Even the hypocrites, who he knew were hypocrites, were not, were not Muslims, and were causing destruction uh, were causing problems throughout the Muslim society, when they would come to ask him for his forgiveness, he would let them go. Even though he knew they were hypocrites. Because he didn't want to cause more problems throughout the, the Muslim community during that time. So he would let them slide for what they used to do. So it shows you how forgiving he was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also his patience. And several examples we have mentioned how patient he was in several aspects of his life. He would be patient. When he went to Ta'if, we mentioned this last night, but I believe the majority of the brothers were not here there last night for the lecture last night. When he went to Ta'if, which is to the south and the north of Mecca, who knows? Geography. Where is Ta'if? To the south of Mecca. When he went there to, to call the people of Ta'if to Islam, after his people hadn't accepted, what did they do with him? They said, Marhaba, welcome. What did they say to him? What did they do to him? 
Huh? They cursed at him, slandered him, and sent their children out and ordered them to throw rocks at him, alayhi salatu wasalam. When they threw the rocks at him, the blood poured down his body, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, until his sandals were filled with blood. At this time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because we're talking about someone who's a prophet, not a normal person, sent to him the angels of the mountains. And just as so many people, the people of Nuh, the people, all these people who were tortured throughout history because they disobeyed the prophets. Now the Prophet has the opportunity, the ability to have these people be punished on the spot and to be tortured because they disobeyed the messenger of God. So when he came to them, he said, if you want, we will close the mountains and we will crush them between the mountains and Taif and all of them will be demolished as a punishment for what they have done to God's Prophet. What did he say? What did he do? What did he choose? And I, like I said to the brothers yesterday, what would you have done? What would you have chosen if you had the opportunity? Let's be honest. I mean, all of us just to think for a second. Ask yourself. Honestly. And the majority of us, if not all of us, would have taken the opportunity. Bismillah. Don't even think about it. Tawakkil ala Allah. Do what you got to do. But the Prophet said, what did he say? He said, eh. He said, no. He said, لَعَلَّ اللَّهُ يُخْرُجْ مِنْ أَصْلَابِهِمْ مَنْ يَعْبُدَ اللَّهُ وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِهِ شَيْئًا SubhanAllah. He said, perhaps Allah will, will make from them, come up from their offspring, from their children, somebody who will worship Allah and will not join any partners with Him. So if I look at the mercy He has with mankind, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look how patient He was. The ninth point is our beloved Prophet as a husband. When you look into His biography, this is one of the key points that stands out to people. How he was as a husband. How was he? Huh? Give some examples how he was as a husband. This is bad news. If the brothers can't give any examples, that means you guys aren't good husbands, man. Careful. Huh? I'm their brother. He's not shalai. Okay. And he's, he's in the service of his, of his ahlad. In the food, Allah, whatever the service is. Whatever his, and he, they mention some things in the hadith. And he kind of, خِدْمَةِ أَهْلِهِ Even they say if his, if his shoes were, or some of his, his clothes were, were need to be what? Sewn? He would sew it by himself. Uh, the men nowadays, how are they? Are they in the service of their wives? Hmm? Allah must Alhamdulillah. But the Prophet as, the, as Allah mentioned in the Quran, he is the prime example. The Qudul Hasana. He is the role model for all Muslims and all of mankind to follow. He was in the service of his wife. And she said, as they said, but if they called the adhan for salat, it was like, like he didn't know us. He would be in the service, he would be helping out around the house, whether cleaning or sewing or whatever he had to do, alayhi salatu wasalam. He would be helping out his wives around the house. And showing now the role model, how the Muslims and how mankind should be when it comes to dealing with their wives. Other examples, when it came to even playing with his wives, subhanAllah. As Aisha said, they used to race one another. They would race one another. How many of us have raised our wives now? Huh? <laughs> you can't say that, huh? SubhanAllah. The Prophet used to, play, used to play with his wives. So you'll see the, the role model of, of, of when you look into the biography of our Prophet, peace be upon him, and how he was as a role model when it came to dealing with his wives. Also, Aisha said that she would talk to him a lot at night when he came down. He would always, what? Out of respect. The Prophet used to get up and pray all night, or a, a, good, a, a good portion of that, anyways. Sometimes half the night, sometimes more, sometimes less, sometimes a third of the night. And as it came in the hadith of Aisha, uh, anha, that she said he would pray until his feet would become swollen at night. This is voluntary prayer, not something that's a, a must. And she said to him, why do you pray? Why do you put yourself through so much trouble? And Allah has forgiven all of your past and, and, and future sins. He said, فَلَا أَكُنْ عَبْدًا shukura." Shouldn't I be a servant who is thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He gets up and prays all this time at night. So if you're going to get up and pray at night, the sunnah is to do what after Isha? What's the sunnah to do after Isha? After Isha, the sunnah is to sleep. After Isha prayer, it's to go to sleep. However, Aisha said she would like to talk to him sometimes during his time. So out of respect for his wife, because he knows there's something that, that women like to do, they like to talk. Alhamdulillah. So he will respect her for this, and he will listen to her throughout the night as she talked to him. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The tenth point is the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was a very brave man. And all people love people who are brave. 
Now you look now at the movies who are made about certain people throughout history. And why did they choose them? Because of their bravery. People loved them. Even if they were not successful in what they tried to do. Omar Mukhtar, he was successful obviously, but he was caught at the end and executed. When the people made the movie about him, about Omar Mukhtar, the non-Muslims made the movie, not the Muslims. Then the Muslims came and changed around, they changed the music, the Anashid and what have you. But the people who originally made the movie about Omar Mukhtar was not the non-Muslims. What, what, was, what was it that stood, about, stood out about Omar Mukhtar that made them want to make a movie about him and respect him so much? He was brave, a brave man who stood up for what he believed in. The Prophet wasallam was the example of bravery to all of mankind. And the story in the hadith with the Prophet ﷺ, they heard a big boom outside of Medina. They didn't know what it was. A big boom outside of Medina. It startled everybody in Medina. For the non-Muslims who were here, Medina is obviously the city where the Prophet ﷺ was living during that time and where he died and was buried. May the peace and blessing of Allah be upon him. In Medina, you'll see they heard this big boom in the story. So everybody came out startled, not knowing what to do. Okay, the boom came from this direction. What was it? Now the people are saying, what should we do? Should we go out or not? They're debating on what to do. During this time, they see that the Prophet, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, is coming back on a horse with no saddle, with his sword on the side. He said, I went to see what it was. He said, it was nothing. Don't worry about it. You will not be startled after today. Subhanallah. This is the, the, the leader of the country who is going out to the, to the source of the sound, of this big boom. He didn't tell, no, get down. Okay, now, get, now we'll get some groups. Go, you go this way, I'll go that way. And then come back and tell me what happened. I'll, I'll be down here. He went out, he didn't, even, didn't even think about it. And it's showing now because the people, as soon as they came out and then came back, he, he, he's coming back. So that means as soon as he heard the boom, he gets on the, on the horse, no saddle, sword on the side only. And if they're coming to Medina, the non-Muslims to harm somebody, he's the one they want to harm. Alayhi salatu salam. So subhanAllah, he, he goes directly to the, to the source of the sound and finds there was nothing. Tells him, don't worry, you will not be startled after today. SubhanAllah. Alim. The last point, which I will stop at, point number 11, and the, it goes on and on, but I want to open, inshallah, the floor for any questions that anybody might have, is the fact how he used to strive for justice. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. The famous story during the Meccan time when Abu Jahl had stolen camels from another person from another tribe because the, the strongest tribe during that time in the Arab uh, Peninsula was who? Quraysh the tribe of the Prophet so this man came to sell some camels so Abu Jahl said I'll buy the camels from you and I'll give you the money for them so he took the camels didn't give the guy the money this poor man is in, what can you do he's Quraysh he's, not, he's, he's from Skin no? he's not somebody who's from the, the, the country so they come to him and they go and they're looking for somebody to help him. So they sent him to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And everybody was scared to go to Abu Jahl. Because he was somebody important. He was somebody who had strength in society during that time. So without hesitation, our beloved Prophet, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, immediately went to Abu Jahl. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with what scared Abu Jahl into giving this man back his camels. Also when the Islamic State was established, when the woman from the Makhzumi tribe was caught stealing and she was supposed to be punished and she is from the people from one of the best tribes in that time her tribesmen didn't want her to be punished so they sent one of the companions to the Prophet uh, peace be upon him and asked that he would let her slide for this what did the Prophet do? as we're talking about justice we have, we have a law anybody who gets caught stealing this anybody who does this this is the law now the Islamic State has been established and we have laws for everything now. What did he say? No. He wouldn't let, this, this is a ruling. He said, you, are you coming to give, to overturn something that has been ruled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He became angry. And then he gave an example to show how severe it was and to be just on everybody at every time. He said, even if the daughter of Muhammad, Fatima, who is the best, one of the best of all of the women in the history of Islam. She would never steal. But he's bringing an example to show you how justice would be served to anybody. He said even if she were to have been stolen, then she would have been punished in the same way. Subhanallah. In the same way she would have been punished. So even if the most beloved person to him from the women, was, was, and he, his daughter Fatima, 
Sayyid Sayyidat al-Jannah radiallahu anha. So now you see that he strove alayhi salatu wasalam to implement just, justice in his life and on the earth. And these are 11 examples from his biography and the list goes on and on. And I call everybody here, Muslim or non-Muslim, to read the biography of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam. And you'll see you'll benefit time and time again. No matter how many times you read it, you'll find new things of benefit. Alhamdulillah, now the biography has been written in all languages, I believe. You'll find any good books that have written. I would recommend in the English language uh, the book of uh, Dr. Sal Salabi. It's in three volumes and been translated. I recommend that. There's also other good books. That's probably one of the best books. Uh, perhaps, I don't know about for, for non-Muslims, maybe a smaller version, obviously, uh, that they could get, inshallah, from another book and benefit, inshallah. Now we'll open the floor, inshallah, for questions uh, that anybody has, inshallah ta'ala. Wallahu alam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Muhammad. In English, it's not coming to me. But it's a three-volume book. If you go on Dar es Salaam's website, and you look in the history, you see the Sira books. It's a, it's a three-volume one. And his, his last name, the author's last name is Salabi. Uh, he's a, a Libyan scholar. He studied in the same college I studied in Medina. I think he's here in Qatar, by the way. I think he lives in Qatar. Anyway, he's got a lot of bo good books in Arabic. Uh, and now, alhamdulillah, is starting to get translated into the English language. Uh, somebody will ask The brother in the front has a question. Also, the, if the, the non-Muslims are here, they have any questions, whether it's about our beloved Prophet or anything else, they want to know about Islam, we'll give them the floor first, inshallah. My question is, when we're talking about the Prophet Muhammad you may be sure about uh, Barakas and all that. But once I just go on the study this, you know, this prophet has got so some things about him, he impressed some people. But why did people do not follow the Sunnah? Hmm. And it was the Sunnah, did the Sunnah for Muhammad, do this, do this. Why people do not do this? Is it the thing? Is the real prophet? I'm not. Hmm. Um, I don't think it has to do anything with him thinking he's a real prophet or not. I mean, obviously, inshallah, they do. But it's, it, goes, it goes back to having their iman being weak. Their faith is weak and not strong. So shaitan overcomes them. And they tend to follow shaitan more than uh, their beloved Prophet ﷺ. And the people who claim that they love the Prophet and don't follow him in his actions, obviously this is love that is not, uh, not real love. Because if you really were to love the Prophet ﷺ, you would follow him in his sunnah and all aspects of his life. So it's not that the fact that they don't think he's a real Prophet. Obviously, anybody who says they, 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 you know, they, they testify that there's no deity to worship except for Allah and that he is the messenger of Allah. Obviously, they, they believe in him. But due to weakness in their faith and their iman, this is probably why they don't follow him everything. And unfortunately, this is why now also and Islam does not spread as fast as it should because the people do not implement the sunnah uh, the way of the Prophet in their lives. If they were to do that, inshallah, we would not face the same problems we face today as, as Muslims. Allah Our brother, we suggest, we'll ask question. Ask your question that yeah, make it make it short, because a lot of time, a lot of brothers they like to tell a story when they ask the question. Uh, it takes a long time, so make it short, please. Good, good point. But go, go back to the beginning. What did you say happened last year? I didn't, I didn't catch the beginning. Okay. Yeah, what did I put the American thing that was uh, I killed hmm. as a target? No, it was, it was, it was December 25th last year. Okay. Probably by Mutra. Yeah. They said it was as a result of what America did to people in Yemen. Hmm. They wanted to defend. So I want to ask what's the Islamic point of view in this if we are tempted? In Islam, the ends does not justify the means. Maybe the non-Muslims, they see this, but Islam, or Muslims, we do not see this. So now, the, uh, the Prophet did not seek revenge for himself. And if we want to be true Muslims, this is the example we have to follow. This is the first thing. The issue you mentioned, and obviously now, if that person were to have been successful in what he tried to do, who are the people he would have killed? 
Were they people who were killing the Muslims and fighting the Muslims? Or were they innocent people? Obviously, they were innocent people. Even on the same plane with him were Muslims. So if he would have been... And obviously, if he would have been successful as well, the plane would have fallen onto the streets of Detroit and would have killed innocent people as well. So obviously, Islam does not allow killing innocent people. So it, 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 to, in, it, like, you always have to know that the end does not justify the means. Just because somebody has done something wrong, and we have an exa example, we always say in English, two wrongs don't make a right. Just because somebody has done wrong to us as Muslims doesn't mean we return and do it the same way. It's not permissible in Islam. It's not Islam. Islam like uh, you said that the Prophet, uh, Prophet uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam helped uh, wife and all in uh, housework and kitchen and all. Nowadays in the modern world, we have our gas cooker and all sorts of modern appliances. And at the same time, husbands and all are uh, very busy and they are very tired. So nowadays, these wives and all asking, you see, you didn't follow Prophet Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What can you answer? I can the husbands are very tired. Is this true or not true? You come home from work, you're tired or not? Are you tired or not? Don't be scared. Your wife, your wife can't see you from there. I don't know who said it. Huh? You're tired when you come home or not? It's true. Men are tired when they come home from work. So that's why they expect the woman to do everything. But I want to show you something. Women, how many jobs do they have? Full-time jobs. First of all, the children in itself. Full-time job or not? Full-time job. The cleaning around the house, full-time job or not? <coughs> Cooking, full-time? Full-time. Three meals, mashallah, kids, mashallah. So now this is three full-time jobs. And then she has to take care of you because you're lazy. Four full-time jobs. And the only full-time job you have is one. And then you want to complain. So now you see you're in more need to implement the sunnah of the Prophet so I'm helping her out. The kids themselves will lie something difficult. It's not an easy thing to do. Now when the kid wakes up at night, he has a fever, teething, when he's a baby, who gets up? You get up, and put him back to sleep? She gets up. The mother. SubhanAllah. So now, we have to realize this. Always forget, don't forget, she has four full-time jobs. So at least make it three. Help out a little bit, inshallah. Where you help out on the house. This is the sooner the process ends. And, and this is a misunderstanding that a lot of our brothers have, is that they think, I'm saying this, I'm not good at helping around the house. I'm not going to say, oh, I'm not sure. I, I try, but I'm, I'm not that good anyway. But we try to help out a little bit. But the process is always just to help out. Woman, she's busy, more busy than you. Wallahi, more busy than you. Full time job. She has no free time in her life. And to maybe her kids become older and they get married and they leave the house, then she might have maybe. And to, uh, she has kids, even then she's worried about the kids all the time. So you find a woman, she's more busy than the man and she's more tired than the man. So that's why we need to focus on implementing the, uh, the sunnah of our beloved Prophet. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Um, please um, tell us more about um, the allegations uh, that we heard from the Muslim society about uh, our beloved Prophet marriage to um, Siti Aisha. Um, I think you can understand that um, uh, there's an allegation that Siti Aisha was very young at that time, yeah. about the marriage, seven years old or nine years old. This, it seems, whenever you talk about the process, and this is a topic that always comes up. But I want to ask a question. Let's talk about the marriage to Aisha at a young age. It's that allegation. <laughs> now, you know, we're not going to lie and say she wasn't young. She was young when, they got, when, she got, when the process had married her. Why is this something that's come up nowadays? Why didn't it come up a long time ago? This is a question I want, to, I want, I want answered first. Why the people who wanted to kill him, the people who used to call him before Islam, they called him what? What do they call him before Islam? As-Sadiq al amin The truthful, the trustworthy. These people, when they, when they, after he became, after he, and Islam came to him, and he started to spread the message of Islam, they changed and started to call him what? A liar, a sorcerer. Uh, what else? Crazy. And then these people who were saying all these things, the people who wanted to kill him, tried time and time again to kill him. Why didn't they say anything about his marriage to Aisha? If it's something that can weaken his status in front of the people and make him look bad, why didn't they use it? Answer, why, why is no answer? There's a bunch of dead faces. I think it's better we go back to the masjid. You guys in the masjid, mashallah, are pumped up here. I don't know what's wrong. Maybe the, you're in the chairs, mashallah, everybody's laid back. Or maybe I'm boring tonight, I don't know. Huh? 
Why didn't they use this as, as, an, as, as evidence for them? Because it was something that was normal at the time. Even if you look in the West, until recently they started to change the 18 thing and this, even in the rules in the West and the laws in the West, the, even to the age of 12 they were allowed to get married in most Western countries. So it was something that was normal during that time. That's why nobody looked at it as being something, as they say now, somebody, an older man with a younger woman having all this nonsense that we hear today. So it was something that was normal. That's the first thing. Also, what was the wisdom? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose this woman to be his wife? And he was not with her. They were married. She was married at a young age, not with her until she became a woman. Uh, well, now when she became a woman, and, and also so you know, I'm going to point out something, that women today, they are different from the women back then. Because the women back then, they became women at a very young age. And that's why Imam Shafi'i, he even mentioned one of, the, one of the weird things he found, or the strange things he found in Medina, was a woman who was a 21-year-old grandmother. Pay attention. A 21-year-old grandmother. So and he, that was very, probably very young because, I mean, she was married, her daughter was married also at a very young age. So this, he, he, he was surprised by that. But anyways, at that time, they were married very young. That means they became, obviously, she, she conceives a child at that young age. means they have to, but there were women at that young age. Uh, so so this, we, we, this, the, this is the main, the key point. It was not something at that time that was considered to be abnormal or something that was uh, looked down upon. Also, look at the hikmah, the wisdom behind the marriage to Aisha radiallahu anha. Who is she to the Muslims? What is her status in Islam? What is her importance in Islam? The, the religion that you know today, maybe a, a, a good, uh, how, how much of it is from Aisha radiallahu anha? How the Prophet sallallahu acted in his house, who, who are the ones that, that, that narrated most of his hadith? Aisha radiallahu anha. Now they come now and say, you know, the scholars of Islam, uh, scholars of, of the world and women, and women's rights and what have you. I said, well, we had a scholar, a major scholar, 1400 years ago. The people used to come to her after the death of the Prophet sallallahu and would ask her about questions and in Islamic law. They would ask her about this, this, this thing, the sayings and the actions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so also from the, she was at a young age, she was able to what, memorize this and then relay it to the Ummah. Also from the wisdoms. There's many things about it, inshallah, I'm writing now uh, in my thesis and the master's de degree about this, inshallah. So in the future, we can go into more detail. But this is the main thing, is that you cannot look down upon something from another society. And now, uh, people, and this is the problem when you're talking about understanding Islam. People don't understand Islam. People don't understand the, the, the customs in the society. And that's why you see the Prophet Sallallahu how wise he was when he sent... Mu'adh radiallahu an to Yemen. What did he tell him about the people of Yemen? You're going to come to people who are the people, people of the book. So he's getting him ready to know the type of people he's dealing with. So when you talk about another society, when you talk about another society, you have to see that things are normal and abnormal there. So now when people get at they attack us today as Muslims, they say this and this about the Muslims and their societies, this, this stuff is normal to us and it's not normal to them. And this is the, one of the big reasons about misconception about Islam is that the Westerners want us, I want, I want our society, they want to pass rulings on the Muslims based on what they believe in in their societies. They have to pay attention to this. So this is the key in refuting this misconception, is that it was not something that was uh, looked down upon during his time, but it was the people who were attacking him and trying to kill him, alayhi salatu wasalam, they would have used this for an evidence. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, can you uh, just uh, make how the husband you're scared tonight. I think a brother is scared. <laughs> yeah, uh, when, when they I'm not traveling in three days, so I'm definitely clear. You guys have to deal with that. <laughs> like, uh, when they travel uh, out of the cities uh, uh, to work, you know, for two years, three years, and all, uh, what do you suggest suggestions about that? And what are the you know, derivations from the books? So like and in Islamic law, it's haram for the husband to be away from his wife for more than six months. Haram. And that's why I would say haram. Yeah. And for now, when the, the Khalifa, he asked, his, and he, and he, how long can the, the, the Muslim woman be? And he, and he indirect is asking, be without her husband. Because just as a man can have fitna and fall into fitna, also a woman can fall into fitna. So he said, she, he said she can be patient and far away from her husband for four months. And then, you know, so he added on two months for what? The traveling during that time, obviously it took... Uh, some time to get there. So they, they, that's why they made an Islamic law that the limit for the husband to be far away from his wife is no more than six months. And now, unfortunately, the, the world we live in, you have the, some of the people who have companies here, they only give the brothers tickets every two years. 
So this is haram for them. And this is, so now the brothers should always focus on making sure, even if it's just a week vacation, where the brothers can go back for one week or two weeks to be with their family, this is what is wajib, it's compulsory. So there's no, you can't say because of this, because of that, it's haram. We have five minutes left. You have to uh, get permission from the... If there's anybody else, the brother has... has Neil, sorry. Yeah, let them ask questions. You guys, you guys are too... Uh, I have a question from the sisters. Uh, it's linked to a question before. Social networking sites such as Facebook how and what are we supposed to react to these? The anti-anti topics that are uh, groups that are anti-Islam, anti muhammad and so on. On Facebook, for example, you can complain to them and ask them to close it. So you can do what you can do. You can open up another page to protest against it. All of that's good, inshallah. And it, it's important. And, but sometimes uh, you have to. It, it depends on the site. Is the site itself something that a lot of people are going to? There's some sites, and this is important, very important, because there's some sites that are not, uh, nobody looks at it. And I don't want to say the name of somebody, something was sent to me the other day. Uh, a, a very grotesque title was sent to me about Allah, not about the Prophet. And I looked at the members of it, there's only six members. So for now, for us to refute this and send it out to all of the friends we have, beware of this site, you're actually propagating for this site. So if it's a site that's not, and that people are not really looking at, don't, don't big it up and give it but, uh, something it doesn't deserve. But if it is something that's there, you can complain to the people, you can protest, make another page against it and protest, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, there is one mic here from the ladies. Sister Suraya, bring the mic. Encourage the last question. Yeah, don't be shy. If you have a question, ask a question. It's okay. Um, the uh, is it, what is the hukum regarding drinking? Uh, is it permissible to stand whilst you're drinking? Or must you sit whilst you're drinking? They should rub in chairs, it's my fault. Uh, it's, the, <laughs> it's the Sunnah, it's the Sunnah. And the, now the scholars of Islam have mentioned that it's from the Sunnah. And obviously, some say you might say it's more cruel, but it's from the Sunnah, obviously, to sit down when you drink. <coughs> I mean, the, the other hadith we should draw from this, and uh, obviously it's something that shows you that it's more cruel. You know, the hadith, because it's been confirmed that the Prophet he drank when he was standing. So if you, you, know, you look at the hadith, when you look for the hukum, the rule in Islam, you take from all of the hadith. So obviously there's one hadith that said, you know, it would be better to throw up what's in your stomach if you were to uh, drink while standing. But there's another hadith that proved that he did it, and I saw time he used to sit down. Also, he, it's been confirmed that he stood up. So it's more cruel, some say, to, to, to stand up. But unfortunately, for now, has put me in a position where I have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> so last question from uh, women. Last question. On, on Peace TV, they put the chair behind us so we can sit down and drink during the conversation. Okay, um, actually, I want to let you hear yeah, Put it next to your uh, mouth, Mike. Okay. Um, actually, I want to ask you that people living in the West, they should always speak louder. Uh, I, can't, I, can't, I can't hear you. Sorry. I'm asking you regarding the people living in the West. Since we find some Muslim who convert, uh, Christian who convert to be Muslim, and then when they go to live maybe in America or UK, specifically UK, people had hardship in terms of law and um, for instance, for example, if, like a Muslim who comes from India or Pakistan, he's married to two wives, and then when he comes to UK, it's like um, so. As a Muslim or as a Sheikh, do Muslim or Islamic council, do they recognize Muslims and respect their law and culture and the way they follow the soul of the Prophet and what they do together? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I caught some of that. I don't understand exactly what the question is. If you would just sum, summarize it maybe in one or two sentences. And um, what, what exactly are you asking? Could you give an, uh, an example and then I don't understand what the question is. Okay, I'll give an example. I have a question. Example I understood. I want the question. <laughs> yes. The question is, how are Muslims treated in, uh, in the West countries? Like, you came, or U.S., in terms of, like, the prophet had several wives. Because it's against the law in the West to have more than one wife. Mm. 
Um, in, in, in general, I mean, I, I don't know about the UK. I can talk about America because I know the laws in America. In America, uh, polygamy it comes right after treasony, and then it comes to the, the danger of the, the law. So it's just if you were to have treasony against your country, and then to have a second wife is almost the same thing in America, American law. However, what we do in America is uh, you don't uh, officially have an official contract from the courts. If you don't have an official contract from the courts, it's not a problem. They don't ask you. Because you can, in America, you can have a wife and have six girlfriends. It's not a problem. So as long as it's not uh, done in the courts, they don't ask us. And alhamdulillah, how many of the Muslim brothers, and I think the majority, especially the ones who are reversed, the, the born Muslims, they seem to be a little scared, you know, I don't know why. But the, uh, the, a lot of the brothers who have come to Islam, mashallah, they have a lot of wives in the West. And nobody, alhamdulillah, has had any problems with that. But like I said, it can't be done. So I mean, obviously, I don't, you say to respect their laws. We don't respect their laws because it goes, in this situation, because it goes against Islam. However, you don't want to be stupid and go to jail either. So now, and then be with no wife. Huh? He had three and now he has zero because he's in jail. So it, what's important is that you have to be smart. When you're living in a non-Muslim society, you don't want to cause problem to yourselves or uh, to any of your family members. And uh, the boss is on the, uh, the side of his seat. So that's it.